Good morning and a very warm welcome to you all as we gather as the community of St. Martin's wherever we are to celebrate the third Sunday of Advent. This is the Sunday that is in the old church called Gaudete Sunday or the Sunday of joy. And you'll hear those glimmerings of joy echoing through our readings this morning and as we light our pink candle. Just a couple of um, announcements. Um, a very warm thank you to all of the men who got together for the beer and burger evening on Tuesday. And we'll look forward to more of those gatherings as we go. And if the women of the parish are feeling left out, um, you can always organize a Chardonnay and cookie night or something like that too. And I would be very happy to help. And this Wednesday at our wonderful Wednesday happy half hour from 4 till 4.30 by Zoom, you're invited to come on board and maybe we can have a little talk about a cookie exchange or a baking exchange because I know there are bakers and there are takers and maybe we can find a way of putting everybody together. Let's just take a moment to prepare ourselves for worship and then we'll begin. The parish of St. Martin's acknowledges that we live and work and worship on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. We pray that Christ's reconciling love will be reflected in our words and in our actions. The Lord be with you. And with Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us, and write both these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now a word for the young at heart. I brought something this morning to celebrate the season of Advent and maybe you've been doing some baking at home too. But what I have here today if I can get the box open, are some gingerbread cookies, some gingerbread men, and some gingerbread women, and some gingerbread whatever they want to be. And I don't know about you, but I find that baking is a joyful thing to do partly because it smells so good in the kitchen, and partly because you can make treats for others to share. And so these little people have come to keep us company here in the church this morning, but they're all going out to friends and neighbors after the service. It's not a new thing to bake cookies at Christmas. We've done it for years and years. In fact, there was a woman that lived almost a thousand years ago whose name was Hildegard. And she made a recipe, probably one of the earliest cookie recipes we even have. And she called it cookies of joy. And she lived in a, a convent with other nuns. And at Christmas time, and at the feast of St. Hildegard, which is in November, they used to bake cookies of joy together and share them. And they knew like I think most children know, 
that cookies are good medicine. In fact, at the bottom of her recipe, she writes down the dosage. Five cookies for each adult per day and two cookies per child. I think that's great. And if you haven't been doing any baking, maybe you could find a way to make your own cookies of joy. But I'll try and get up the recipe for her cookies of joy on the parish website by this afternoon, and you can look for it there. Now we're going to light our candle of joy. And it's the pink candle. So here we go. I wish you were with me here to do this, but maybe you have a candle at home you could light. We light this candle of joy, remembering your joy over us and your promise to renew us in your love, finding joy in this season of anticipation, watching and waiting for your holy light. We come in faith and say, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And let us gather in the prayer for this third Sunday of Advent. Let us pray. God of light, who sent the Baptist to offer hope and to face the world's scorn, open our ears to hear the cries from the margins, exposing our fears, sharpening our vision, and calling us to faith through Jesus Christ, the one who is to come. Amen. We listen for the word of God. The first reading is taken from the 61st chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the first verse. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to prov provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined castle, cities, the devastation of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle this morning is a very special song of joy, and it comes to us from the words of Luke's gospel. It's the Magnificat, the Song of Mary, and I invite you to say this responsively with me. My soul doth magnify the Lord, 
and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath holpen his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The second reading is taken from the first letter to the Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 16th verse. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. And this is the testimony given to John by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let's have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the, out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, why then are you baptizing if you're neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. And this took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Amen. 
Let us pray. Holy One, feed us with your abiding presence, that we may know the joy of the hope to which you have called us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I don't know what the cat is living on. He's a finicky eater. His owner left instructions and a careful schedule of meals, but when he gets his prescribed supper, he looks at us disdainfully and walks away from the bowl. Sometimes I'll come into the kitchen in the morning and find evidence that he's nibbled. The rest of the time, he might as well be surviving on dust bunnies and the occasional crumb. Yet he seems lively and affectionate and none the worse for wear so far. Apparently there's more to this eating business than he's letting on. The cat chooses not to eat. We didn't choose not to be able to come to the table together. Families are not able to share holiday suppers in the ways that we would like. And churches are not able to share Eucharist in the way that is our common Christian practice. Both types of fasting are deeply grieved. And many of us are struggling to find ways to sustain ourselves emotionally and spiritually as communities when we are restricted from physically gathering, especially for our family meal. Those who were blessed in pre-pandemic times to be part of a wider circle of relations and or a community of faith have come to feel these losses keenly. And perhaps in the process, we're gaining a better understanding of our neighbors who were isolated through infirmity or inability even before this season of lockdowns. For those who live alone, or those who cannot come to a Sunday service or another family meal. Recent times have shrunk the world even further. How does God feed us when we are not able to eat with each other? Some in our Anglican communion have called for what is uh, they're naming a Eucharistic fast. That is, we should cease from celebrating communion altogether until such a time as the full community can participate fully in the sacrament. Others have suggested that people bring bread and wine to their computer screens and witness a virtual communion before taking tokens in their hands and consuming them at home. Both approaches focus on the physical elements of the bread and the wine the outward and tangible signs of the inward and spiritual grace that is Holy Communion. And I don't believe either practice gets at the heart of what we mean by this sacrament. If we were to completely stop having communion until the buildings are open and we can gather again, it seems to me that we're discounting the lived experience and spirituality of many in our world who don't have regular access to communion. How often do seniors in care facilities receive reserved sacrament from their parishes? What about smaller, remote, or First Nations communities who don't have a priest resident, who come together around non-Eucharistic worship? And even after it will be safe again for smaller and then larger groups of Christians to meet, not everyone will be physically present. And of those who are, not everyone will receive communion. If we stop this practice until we can all eat, none will. On the other hand, Bread doesn't get any more blessed through electronic means than when we say grace at a meal. And it's good to give thanks and to eat and drink with each other, even when it happens by Skype or Zoom or FaceTime. The Agape gathering at St. Martin's is modeled on the early Christian practice of an Agape meal, of a coming together in love and fellowship 
to share food as a sign of the open table of the community. So it, it seems to me that there's more to the experience of the rite than just having a priest standing up front and the rest of us taking bread in our hands. At its core, the Eucharist is both a sign of a particular community gathered around Christ and Christ's deep pastoral response to that community. God's reality breaks into our world through mundane elements that carry a joyful message of love, of sacrifice. But the spiritual reality is not dependent on bread or wine alone as the body and blood of Christ. The body of Christ is situated in the people that are connected through faith. The host enters us. This is the great thanksgiving, the Eucharist. And we practice together what it means to be a channel of God's grace in a world. We are sanctified, we are made holy through our connection with the divine and each other. In 1941, the poet W.H. Auden wrote a very long poem. It was called, For the Time Being, a Christmas Oratorio. And it was written during the dark days of the Second World War. In the midst of deprivation and depression, he penned these lines. The time being, in a sense, the most trying time of all. The happy morning is over. The night of agony is still to come. The time is noon, when the spirit must practice his scales of rejoicing. When the spirit must practice his scales of rejoicing. Sanctification is a fancy word for the process of practicing rejoicing, even especially in the midst of trying times. St. Paul wrote to a little community of Christians in Greece who are experiencing their own troubles, and he tells them, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. That's from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 and 17. His encouragement to do the good they can comes with the following blessing. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like a musician that needs to daily attend to the basics of warming up and keeping the voice and the fingers nimble to play, we too are to practice giving thanks. And one of the consistent and helpful ways that we know as Christians is the celebration of Holy Communion. There we find not only physical food, but spiritual joy. In observing the celebration of the Eucharist, we look back to its institution when Jesus gathered around the table with his disciples. And we look forward to the day when Christ will come again and the reign of God will be celebrated fully with all the saints at the heavenly banquet. But now, in this time being, as Auden puts it, God comes to us as we practice thanksgiving and sacrifice, and yes, even joy. It's not so much about eating the bread and tasting the wine, as it is feasting on Christ's presence in our midst, in this circle. Does this mean that we need to have a service of Holy Communion online to connect with the Holy? I don't believe it does, but it helps. And if this virtual Eucharist that you're experiencing now is a helpful tool for you to gather us in and to feed us spiritually, let's feed on it joyfully. It's offered on behalf of the community and in thanksgiving for our ongoing life together in Christ. 
It's not meant to be a privileged service for the few of us that are in the building. If we find that it feeds us, then it remains a pastoral and liturgical gift. And through it, we pray for ourselves and for all the world in its brokenness and its beauty. And sometimes, just sometimes, we're pierced by joy with the mystery of it all. But let's not confine ourselves to the experience of spiritual communion in this one sacrament of the church, because we are fed in all ways that God comes to us. In the prayers, in Holy Scripture, in loving action and generous sharing, all convey the joy of a people that faces reality with hope. And joy is not the same as happiness or contentment or security. It's the flash of insight. It's the leap of the heart that recognizes the real presence of Christ. And so when we come to the prayer of consecration, Symbols of bread and wine are lifted high in blessing and thanksgiving by the priest. But we are truly feasting on the word made flesh. Jesus, come among us. So let's rejoice. Amen. I invite you to join with me in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again in glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We gather now, continuing in prayer with the prayers of the people. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For peace from on high and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Melissa, our Archbishop, for John, our Bishop-elect, for Stephanie, our Interim Priest, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Elizabeth, our Queen, for Justin, our Prime Minister, for the leaders of all the nations and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the cities of, or for the North Vancouver's city and district, for every city and community, and for all who live in them in faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for good weather and for abundant harvests for all to share. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel by land, water, or air, for the sick and the suffering. And he, here we name Colleen, Charles, Verna, Harry and Beryl, Karina, Amanda, Ralph, Jane, Barbara, Bill, Joe and Mike, Donna and Margot. Asking for healing from their problems. For prisoners and captives and for their safety, health and salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And here I also pray for the or special prayer for those who are in training or about to be responsible for the transportation of vaccines. It is a responsible job where the best of intentions can lead to disastrous results. Let us pray for them. Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For, de uh, for our deliverance from all affliction, strife, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And in our regular prayer cycle for the diocese, we pray for St. John the Apostle, Port Moody, the Reverend Vivian Lamb, the Reverend Ann Art Anchor, the Reverend Lillian Elliott, St. John the Divine, Maple Ridge, the Reverend Laurel Dahill, St. John the Divine Squamish, the Reverend Cameron Gutyar, St. John Shaughnessy, the Reverend John Stevens, Bishop Coadjutor elect, the Reverend Elizabeth Ruder Silas. And in our companion parish overseas, St. Leo the Great, Sad Sedan, and San Louis Mahae in the Diocese of Northern Philippines. And within our own parish, Katie, Dave and Allison, Doreen, Eleanor, and Elle. For all who have died, especially those we have worshiped with in this parish, most recently, Irene K. Jean. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remembering Martin and all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. To you, our Lord. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead the new life following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. And we say together, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life to the honor and glory of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be always with you.
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is, meet right so to do. it is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, creator and preserver of all things. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who in the fullness of time came among us in our flesh and opened to us the way of salvation. Now we watch for the day when he will come again in power and great triumph to judge this world, that we, without shame or fear, may rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessing and glory and thanksgiving be unto thee, almighty God, our heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to take our nature upon him and to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memorial of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink this all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me.
Wherefore, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, we, thy humble servants with all thy holy church, remembering the precious death of thy beloved Son, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again in glory, do make before thee in this sacrament of the holy bread of eternal life and the cup of everlasting salvation, the memorial which he hath commanded. And we entirely desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And we pray that by the power of thy Holy Spirit, all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore, amen. Go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.